Okay, so we are now looking at uh, an assignment review. This is uh, the GBS six question production operation management. So there are two questions that came in this assignment. The first question is on the forecasting and forecasting techniques. One of the one one of the topics. Among the, among the six topics that are there in POM. So the first one is on forecasting and forecasting, uh, forecasting techniques. And uh, in forecasting, we use a uh, regression and correlation analysis. So this question was on regression and correlation analysis. Okay, so the mag petroleum is a small the SME specializing in the sale of lubricants for industrial use. The company which is owned and operated by Angelina has just completed its third year operation. <clears throat> During this time, Angelina has sought to establish a reputation for the company and the supplier of high quality lubricants. The efforts made by Angelina and her staff have provided successful and our company has become one of the best and the fast, fastest growing privately owned company in Zambia. Angelina has concluded that in order to plan better for the growth of the company in the future, it is necessary to develop assistance that will enable her to focus lubricant sales by month for up to one year in advance. Angelina has available data on the total lubricant sales that were realized during the previous years, <clears throat> previous three years of operation. These data are provided in the table. Okay, so we have the data that has been provided on the table, <clears throat> the table here. Now, for what forecasting method would you recommend to Angelina? Just find your choice, and then we'll go to focus the sales for January through December of the fourth year using the forecasting method you recommended in part A. All calculation should be to three decimal places. Okay, so now each of these years we have year, first year, second year, and third year. Each year has 12 months. So meaning to forecast the, the year four, we should have we should use a regression analysis to come and substitute the figure so that we find for year four. So year four, we will be able to substitute the figures in the regression line for us to get uh, the forecast for year four. But what goes on in this course in POM, in forecasting, this is not a simple regression. We are going to de-seasonalize the data. So on this one, we are going to Decisionalize the data, and I will explain what it means, what is involved when you are decisionalizing the data. So this is what they want us to find the forecast, sales forecast for January through December of the fourth year or year four. All right, so now, getting down to this one, we are to uh, check on the... Okay, so we are now to check on the, the use the this um, document. So okay, so now the forecasting technique. The first question says, what forecasting technique can we use here? So the first question, the forecasting technique to use on question one. Okay, the first one was asking us the forecasting technique to use. Okay, so they are saying which forecasting technique. Are we supposed to, can we use uh, as we are uh, forecasting here? The first question says, uh, what forecasting method would you recommend to justify your choice? Okay, so the forecasting method to use here is the regression and the, the correlation analysis where we need to find the regression line. So that's an explanation of the first part of the question. Okay, so we we'll come here and say, okay, the forecasting method to use here on this one is the regression 
and correlation analysis. Okay, in order to determine the sales forecast for the next period or the next year. Okay, so we are going to use the regression and correlation analysis. Now, the regression and correlation analysis requires the use of both the independent variable, which is x. x is a variable that exists on its own. So we have x value. And of course, we have also the dependent variable, which is y. So, okay, so we are going to have the independent variable, which is x, and the dependent variable, which is y, in order to find the forecast for the next period using the historical data. So we're going to use the historical data for us to find the forecast for uh, the next period. Now, the regression line to use is given by, we have uh, our, 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 our y is a dependent variable, which is the sales, and then the, the x is the number of years. So if you talk about years, X, then this Y, the, uh, the alpha is the intercept and the beta is the slope of the regression line. So this is just a build up of this topic that was covered in quantitative method and the regression and correlation analysis to find the focus for the next period. So getting down to, to the part B of the question, the first question answers, we just, the answer for the first question is just this focusing method where we use the regression this is the recommended method that we are going to now use to apply as we go to the, the other part of the, of the question. Okay, so the other question now, the other part of the question says, uh, focus the sales now. Using the same method we recommended, the first one, focus the sales for January through December of the fourth year using the forecasting method you have recommended in part A above. All right, so now this is about what is going on. So um, we have a number of uh, months here from January to December for each of the year, for each year. So what we need to do is we need to de-seasonalize the data now. Okay, so to de-seasonalize the data, we simply divide the seasonal data by the respective index. So for part B, we need to calculate the seasonal index. So calculating the seasonal index is given by seasonal index is equal to monthly average divided by overall average. So we find the monthly average, then we divide by the overall average. And then the overall average is equal to overall total, then divide by the total number of measures. The average simply means the mean, okay, for the month, for each month, we find the mean for each month. And then also this is the mean for all months. All right, so now getting down to the table here, January through December of year one, we have 242, 263 uh, for the second year and 282. So the, the formula here is the monthly average over over average. So find the monthly average, which is 262.33, the average of these three uh, figures then you actually divide by three. So we're getting 262.33. This is about the monthly average. So the overall average is equal to overall total divided by the total number of measures. So overall average is equal to overall total. So the total for everything else is 6756. Okay, then divide by 36 months that we have, of course, each year as 12 months. So we are simply uh, finding the total for all these values, which are here uh, for, for the six months. This is the average for overall. Now we got uh, the 187.667. This is the, the, the overall average. So meaning that as we get to find the seasonal index, is equal to monthly average over over average. So monthly average divided by over average, we're getting 1.3. 98 and in this uh, question they are saying we need to uh round off to three decimal places so we're going to three decimal places so this is how the season index index where these ones were found by simply dividing monthly average over the over average all right using these formulas now we can uh, move on after finding a season index we now de-seasonalize the data 
Because after getting the seasonal index, we deseasonalize the data simply by dividing. So we now deseasonalize the data simply by dividing the seasonalized data by the respective seasonal index. So what we are doing, we are dividing, these are called seasonal data. These are seasonal. These data are called seasonal. So I simply say, so using the seasonal data, we can find the seasonal, uh, we can seasonalize the data. So these are called seasonal, seasonalized values, which are here, these ones. All right, so after getting the, um, the seasonal index, index, you need to now um, visualize the data simply by dividing. So you have divided 242 by 1.398. So all these values, we are dividing them by the seasonal index. Even for say for year two, we will be dividing by the same index. Year three will be dividing by the same index so that we decentralize the data. All right, so now meaning we divide all these using this format, dividing all these cells which by the seasonal index. So these are the, so this is our decentralized values. These are called values that are decentralized. So after getting these values, we get these values for uh, each of the year, each year, okay, these values are the ones I'm getting. They're called decentralized values. So using the values that are decentralized, we now uh, compute uh, the regression line. So year three, also similarly, we are just using the same concept of data decentralization. So after computing uh, these figures, now we use we now use this table to find the regression line. So we are getting x are values from one to thirty six because there were thirty six months because each year has how many months? Twelve months. So that's why we ended on thirty six here. So after using this, entering the data in the calculator, the y values are the ones that we are using. The data that has been decentralized. So we are getting that X from here and Y, these are the values we're multiplying to get X, Y, we're simply multiplying these two to get X, Y. Then the Y, we're just querying this to get this. And then here we are using this one also to get the last one. So this data you can enter, we can compute manually to get the, um, the values that are total values here. After getting the total values, we now, uh, substitute in the equation to get the alpha because we are using the regression line, which is alpha plus uh, bx. So what is important is to understand how the values came about. So after this, we now get to define the alpha. You can enter in the data in the calculator using the calculator. You can enter or compute manually here. This figure is the, the beta is the slope. The alpha is what you're finding this is the mean of y. So y bar is equal to summation of y over n. Okay, then our x bar is equal to summation of x over n. Okay, so this is about it, what we have as we are getting the values. Okay, so from here, we now find the beta, which is a slope by using this formula, substituting the figures that we have from the table here. Or even if I enter the data in the calculator, you can just retrieve the values. Then we get our beta is giving us, substituting here, we are getting our beta as beta is 35, actually 0 0.9, 0 0.909. So this is the, the beta value. All right. So after getting that, we are getting, you can now find the alpha. We already found here, 170.76. Can we compare with uh, these other figures here? So this is how the, these ones were computed. Okay, getting to these other figures here, 170, 0 0.9. So this is our beta. So the beta is the same. Here we are getting our beta. This is our beta here. And then this is our alpha. And the substituting these, we, we, we are able to get the regression line, which is equal to y is equal to alpha, then plus bx. So from here, we will be able to compute and substitute and get whatever it is that we need, please. 
So uh, what goes on, we substitute and then using the regression analysis and the values that are decisionalized, we can now find the forecast for year four, okay? So for year four, these values are still decisionalized values for year four. So year four is starting at 36, getting down to 48. So we just have to use that substitute in this regression line, We're substituting there to get the, the figures this side. So this, this is how the figures are coming up. So again, 204.395, the other one getting down, we are getting these figures using the regression line that has been decisionalized, using the values that are decisionalized values. All right, so this is about uh, just a matter of rounding up and what, so this is 204 getting down you're getting so this is how these figures this is where this 37 coming up 38 getting down from here getting down to 48 for year four now this is not a fine way we need now to get back to the values that are seasonalized okay these figures are called the seasonalized values but what we are looking for we're looking for figures that are seasonalized so we need to uh come on so he is after getting these figures here Okay, which are called decisionalized values, the values that are decisionalized. We need to seasonalize the values. So we now to find the seasonalized sales, we should multiply the values that are decisionalized by the respective seasonal index. All right, so meaning the 204 we got multiplied by 1.39, 1.3. So we're multiplying that one by okay. we're multiplying this one by the respective season index. So this is what is going on there. Okay. So this is about what is going on. We are getting the figures that are seasonalized. Okay, so these are now getting. These, these values are the seasonal indexes for each of the month, month from January to uh, December. So we are getting them from the, the these seasonal indexes are coming from uh, these ones. Okay, so they are coming from here, the seasonal indexes. We're using these same indexes to actually seasonalize the values. So we're using these indexes. We are multiplying now the values that we have found, the, the, the values that are Seasonalized, you are multiplying them by the seasonal indexes for us to get the seasonalized values. So this is about what is going on here on this one. Okay, so okay, so this is a this is got according to what is going on so we are now getting down to the values so the values that are seasonalized we are getting to these ones so these ones are called the seasonalized cells so this marks the end of question one of this problem so these are seasonalized values after using the data that is deseasonalized all right so now getting down to the second question so we can go to question two now. So question two uh, is actually, so this marks the end of the part B of the question one. We are now getting down to question two of this problem. Question two was on MRP, which is material requirement planning. All right. The first one was on forecasting. So what is going on here? We are going to look at the, um, this for the MRP now. MRP has six components, like I mentioned in the other class. So those components will get it down so that you understand them so that A company has two, uh, two products, A and B. Each product A requires two Cs and one D. Then each D requires two Fs and one E. Well, each E requires one F. Each product B requires two, one D and uh, two E's. The table below shows the data from inventory records. So we need now to check, we need to determine and find out what's going on. The lot sizing rules are given for each item, for each product. 
because C is fixed order quantity, D is not followed, and then E is a, a fixed order quantity, then F is period order quantity. And the lead times are given three weeks, that's the time between when an order is placed and when an order is received. Then you schedule receipts, these are units of the commodity that you receive from our suppliers. And then we have the opening stock, which is the beginning stock that we have for each product, are given 25 for C, 0 for D, uh, E is 150, and F is 600. So we need to, the MPS for product A calls for 85 units to be started uh, in week three, and 100 units to be started in week six. The MPS for, this is master production schedule for product B calls for 180 units to be started in week five. Develop the MRP plan showing the gross requirements, the schedule receipts, the on hand, the net requirement, and planned order releases for the next six weeks for items C, D, and F, 30 marks for this. So what is important now is to come up with the product structure tree coming up from here. All right, so each product A requires, each A requires two Cs and one D. Okay, so now we will say, a requires two C's and one D. Okay, so A requires two C's and one D. Then uh, the other one, okay. So that one requires uh, two C's and, and one D. And then each D requires two F's and one E. So we are getting the structure from this information that has been given in the question. So each D requires two F's and one E. Each D requires two F's and one E. Two F's D requires two F's and one E. All right, and then well, each E requires one F. Each E requires one F, so each E requires one F. Okay, so which is the structure for product A. All right, so we get now to B, what B is about. So this structure is coming from the information given in the question. And uh, the other one says each B requires one D and two E's. Each B requires one D and two E's. All right. So now D requires one D and two E's. Okay. So D requires one D and two E's. Okay. So this structure for the sake of the just a repetition for this structure, but for the sake of preparing the MRP, these are these are these other ones here will not consider them when preparing the MRP for each item, but for the sake of the structure, it is needed, it is required that should be there for the sake of the structure. Otherwise, as we as we look at the, the MRP records, we we'll only come and end on, on this part here. Okay, as we prepare the MRP, we, we just consider the, this information up here. This is just a duplication. Now we just repeat because this is the same E. So we just continue for the structure for the sake of the structure here to say E requires uh, one F and D requires uh, two Fs. Okay, so this is about it. The one we have. This structure is supposed to be like this. Now we can now get into the the, the MRP um, for these items. So item, item, the, the information has been given concerning the, the requirements for products A and B. So meaning that uh, these uh, other products, they depend A and B. Without them, these other products will not be there. You C, D, F, these ones will not be there. So the first thing to do is to consider the products, the final products. These are called final uh, product A and B. I mean, this one is a final product. So what goes on now is the, we start by preparing. These are the ones they come, they're coming from A and they're coming from B. So they have given us the information to do with A and B. They're saying MS, MPS for A calls for 85 units to be started in week three. And then introduced to be started in week six. So this one is, has already been there. That's why even on the table, it's not there, meaning that they have told us the requirements for A and B already. So it, this was it. There's no need for us to prepare for A. The A, A and B, they have already prepared for them. All right. So now we, we have 85 units to be started in week three. 
and Android needs to be started in week six. And then the MPS for product B calls for 180 units to be started in week five. So we can now prepare the MRP for C, D, E, and F. Okay, so getting down to MRP for, uh, for C, of course, A has been given. They require 85 units in week three. And then there's also 100 units in week, in week six. That of B, we require uh, 180 units in week five. All right, so now we need to now, so these are, they've just prepared already. So meaning A and B, they have given us where, where they, these uh, values, so we can straight away start preparing C. So we need, there's no need for it for us to prepare A and B because these ones are given already. But we have to know, take note that for product C is coming from A, and C is coming from A, so we are supposed to multiply what is coming from A by the number, the quantity that is here. So the quantity that is here for C is a 2. All right, so quantity that is here is a 2. So meaning what is coming from A, you multiply by 2. So meaning as we prepare MRP for C, we multiply 85 by 2, 100 by 2. So the gross requirements for, for product C is 170 units in week three because we're multiplying this is coming from A and also this is coming from A according to the structure that is there. The structure is that C is coming from A. So whatever is coming from A, you multiply by two. So we know what is there. So we are multiplying by two. So we are getting the 170 and 200. Those are the gross requirements. Now we don't have to forget we need to go and check what is the schedule receipts for C. So the information is there. For C, we have the fixed order quantity of 220 units. So when there's a net requirement, when there's, when there's a shortage, we need to order 220 units. So this is a fixed one, a fixed aspect. We don't order the shortage. We order the fixed ordering policy of 200 units. Even if the requirement is less than that, but we need to order 220 units. And then the lead time time taken between when an order is placed and when an order is received is three weeks. The schedule receipt C is 280 units in week one. The owner and beginning inventory is 25. So these two, every time these two, are, they are added because this is what you have opened with as owner and owner and stock. Then the schedule receipts, these are units that you, you, you purchase from your suppliers. You have received them from suppliers because you have bought supplies, whatever it is that, that he, you have on hand. So these two, they are actually added to for us to see the total stock available so that we can now check if we can meet our demand, which is a gross requirement. So from here now, we, we have seen for C that we have this information. So which is what we use only for C. When we go to D, we have supposed to check what they've been given for D, similarly for E and that of F. So we have the fixed order quantity of 220, three times three weeks, so we can now check. So we have the gross requirements of that. The total receipts is 280 units. So these usually, they are added, the on hand plus the on, the total receipts, the, 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 for us to find the total stock available. So the total stock available is 305, 305, to meet the demand of zero, we still remain with a 305. Then week two, we have this, you can add the 305, which is there, plus zero, then minus what is there on the hand. The gross requirement is zero, so it's three, three, it is two, 305. 305 plus zero minus 170, you're getting 135 on hand. So 135 plus zero, then minus the zero demand, gross requirement, we are going to have one and this two is 135. 135 plus zero minus zero is still 135. 135 plus zero uh, to meet the demand of 200. If we have a shortage, which is the net requirement. So the shortage in this week is what we have as a, as a 65. So when we have the shortage, what is needed now is for us to make an order. So in this week, we have received an order of 220 because there's a problem. So this 220 that we have received, we can, uh, uh, sort out this to 20 minus the, 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 the net requirement, 220 minus the net requirement of uh, 65, 
So you're supposed to have the 155 here. So we put the 155 on that one. So meaning that here, the, for, for us to have a receipt of 220 here in this week six, means means that we are we're supposed to have the release in week three because the lead time is three weeks so lead time is three weeks so this 220 was supposed to be released in week three so this is it about what is going on so meaning that as we look at question three for product c on this other side of course we can make the uh comparisons we can see there's a uh, a 220 here which is coming in week in week three okay so we have a requirement and one and is 155 there so this is what we have this this is the, the mrp for item item c item c because the lead time is it actually three weeks so this is a 220 we have here in week in week three one two three all right so that we see this is a 220 we have in week three, week three Okay, so now we go to the other product, which is product D. So for product D, we are we have to check where the D is coming from. So D is coming from, you go back to the structure so that we see where the D is coming from. If it is coming from two different sources, we need to combine and then come up with a single. So D is coming from, from A as well as D is coming from B. So we need to combine because it's a single product we're talking about. The same product D we are talking about, so we should combine whatever values that was coming. So from A by one goes to D, and of course from B by one because the quantity is one. So from B goes to D because the quantity is one, and then from D goes to D comes from A is coming from A by the quantity is one this side. So meaning that we need to combine them. So we go for D from A. D from A, we check the structure here. D from A is 85. So this one will go to D by 1. Even this one will go to D by 1. Okay. So now what is going to happen is it, we now combine the one. The D is coming from B also um, by 1. So our product structure, our MRP for D will be for A is by one. So this is for this one is coming from is a D coming from A, and there's also a D coming from B by by one by one. So this is where this 85 is coming from. It's coming from the values of A by one because of the structure that we have there. And we combine what is coming from B so that we come up with MRP for a single product, product D. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. The gross requirements we have, which is a zero there in week one. In week two, we have a zero. Week three, we are going to have 85, because it's coming from A. Then for B also, it's 180, because it's coming from, from B. And then this other one is coming from A. So we have combined what is coming from both A and B, so that we come up with a, a single product D. Then from here, we need to check, do we have anything to do with the scheduled receipts? Because this is the format of the MRP, the six components. The first one, like I mentioned, we have the gross requirements, the schedule receipts, the on hand, uh, net requirements, the planned order receipt, and planned order release. This is the format, the standard way that's supposed to be. So these are the gross requirements coming from different products A and B. Then uh, the schedule receipts, we have to check the inventory status file for D. So for D, we are using lot for lot. The on hand is zero. We have a zero here. None, none of the receipts is zero as well. The lead time is two weeks. And then we are using a lot for lot. So here we are using a lot for lot. So this is about product D that we need to go for. So as we check there, no, no on hand, no shadow receipts, but we have lot for lot. So lot for lot means you order the net requirements. The fixed order quantity means even if the requirement is less than that, you order the fixed amount of units. So we are going to have a D, we are going to have the shadow receipts zero, zero, in week one, week two, week three is also zero, week four is also zero, week five is zero, week six is zero, the one and zero for this, each of these. 
So zero plus zero to meet the demand of zero, we are still remaining with zero. Zero plus zero, you add this, it is two. To meet the demand of that, we remain with a zero. Then the zero plus zero to meet the demand of a five. The net requirement here is uh, 85, that's the shortage. So when we have the shortage of this amount, which is 85, we now need to uh, order, whatever we order here is the net requirement. When we're using lot for lot, simply means we should order the net requirements. So that's why we are ordering the whatever it is, the whatever shortage we have is what we order. So we have ordered this to meet the requirement of 85, then we are going to remain with a zero. Then zero plus zero to meet the demand of zero, we remain with a zero. Zero plus zero to meet the demand of 180, we have a net requirement of 180. Now this 180 is what we need to order when we are looking at lot for lot. Lot for lot means the order the net requirement. So order uh, NR. So you order the net requirements for lot for lot. So meaning, meaning that here we are going to have uh, this to meet the demand of 180, we have a shortage of 180. So we order the same 180. We sort out, you remain with zero. Then zero plus zero to meet the demand of 100. This is a net requirement, which is a shortage of 100. We order the same shortage, 100. Then we check what lead time we have here. So for us to have a receipt uh, of one of 85 in week three, we check the lead time. So lead time is two weeks. So meaning that that would have been released two weeks uh, before. That's why we're saying this one should have been released uh, two weeks before. Even this other one would have, would have been released two weeks before. Even this one should have been released two weeks before. So this is how we are coming up with it. The MRP for D in that way. In that way. Now we check the MRP for F, okay? That's the MRP for E. MRP for E, we have to look at the structure where E is coming from. When we we do a combination, we combine. So E is coming from the two. We check where the E is coming from. So E is coming from D as well as E is coming from B, okay? So E is coming from D and E is coming from B, but from B is by two. That all from uh, E from D is by one. So the D that we've prepared, we need to multiply the E coming from D by the quantity that is there we combine with the one D coming from B, okay? That E coming from B by two. So we need to combine these two because it's a single product. So we are going to have, the, the D that we've prepared goes to E by one, and that of B. B is 180 already we have by two. So this one will be by two. Then here, E from D is um, by one. So the D we are from preparing is this one. It will be by one. Then uh, the one coming from um, the other one here, we are coming for the one coming from B is by two. So this by e is by two. Coming from B is by two. So meaning, this one eight times two is the three skiste here, which was coming from B. Then that coming from D, it was D one eight, this is eight to five. And then there's also a D here coming from D, it was by one. So here it was by one. So it was eight to five by one. So it will not change because the quantity was one for that one. So eight to five, one eight and one hundred. So this is about what we have. Concerning MRP for product E. Now, E, we need to check what is happening. Fixed order going to 300 units. So, meaning when there's a problem, we need to order 300 units of the commodity whenever there's a shortage, whenever there's a net requirement. Net requirement simply means the shortage. All right. So, now, as we get to this, we have to check what we have as on hand. On hand is 150. And then we have the shortage receipt of 300 in week three. So here, 300 week three, which is this one, on and is 150. So we have the 150 plus zero to meet the demand of 85, remain is 65. 65 plus zero to meet the demand of zero is 65. 65 plus 300 minus 180 is 185. 
plus the five plus three hundred minus uh, one eighty is one eighty five. One eighty five plus zero minus hundred is eighty five. Eighty five plus zero minus three is kissing. We are going to have eighty five minus a three is kissing, which is a demand. We have a shortage, which is a net requirement in this week. So when we have the net requirements, that's when you need to make an order. You place and you receive that order. A order receipt is a, in a period where you have uh, net requirements. I emphasize order receipts, plant order receipt to be in the quick or period where you have the net what? Net requirements. So here we're going, even if the requir net requirement is, uh, the shortage here is um, uh, three, two, 275, we order a fixed batch of 300 units. So we can now sort out this issue. Okay, we sort out the requirements. And again, we are going to remain with on hand of 25. Okay, so we, of course, there was an order receipt of 300. So in the period when we are, we are, when you have the net requirements, this is where this is a period that we, you need now to uh, our the order receipt. So order receipt is 300. Okay, so the 300, this is what we have to sort out the requirement 275, remain on hand of 25. 25 plus zero minus the demand, which is zero, then we are going to have still one and of 25 units. So for us to have a receipt in week five, it means we placed an order three weeks before because of the lead time that is there. Lead time is uh, so in it's three, three weeks for product E. Three time is three weeks for product E. So that would have been released three weeks uh, before. So that's why this one comes here. So this is how you find it, this MRP for E. Okay, so under this one, you can even confirm this MRP for, for D. We have these, these figures for E. We have 300 units coming in this week, week two. Okay, so this is only the uh, MRP for, for product T E, where you have this 25 and that. Okay, so we now get to the, the last one, which is MRP for the product. The one that is remaining is MRP for product F. So MRP for product F, you check where the F is coming from. So we go back to the product structure tree that we actually obtained. So the product structure tree will just help us to get the F. So F come, is F coming from D, and there's also F coming from E. This other one, it was just for the sake of the extension of the, of the tree, but it's not, it's not supposed to be considered for this F because it's the same product was so just duplicated here for the sake of the structure. So we have this uh, MRP for F will come from F coming from E, F coming from D. We combine for a single product. So whatever came from D, if it was wrong, it will affect the answer for F. F is also coming from E. So we check F, F from E, it's by one, F from D is by two. So we go back to D, what we came, what we got for D, multiply all those by, by the quantity by two. The releases of D will be the gross requirements for F. Also, of course, we'll combine with what is coming from E. All right, so now for D, uh, going to, to F by two, so we multiply whatever you came to obtain for D by two. So this one will be by two by two. These ones, the way they are in the same weeks, the way they are. So 85 by two, so here to be 85 by 2, 170. And then it was also from D, it was 180 by 2, we need 3. Okay, and then uh, we have uh, the other one. Okay, so MRP for, yeah, so we have um, this one by, by 2, by 2, because the structure even 100 by 2. Okay, so this word was supposed to be MRP for F. The E has been prepared. This is MRP for F. Okay, so MRP for F. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So the gross requirements, we have 85 by two, which is 170. This is coming from, we check where it's coming from. So it's coming from, from D. So we go to the strike F from D by two. So this is coming from, from D. So for F, here, yeah, this is coming from D. This is also coming from D. This is also coming from D. All right. So now there is also by two, this is from D by two. Now there's also F coming from F coming from E. 
So F coming from E by one. So we go to E, E is this one. So E is this one by one. Okay, so it's a 300 here. We use this 300, the release. So the releases are the ones we use as they go to the other product. So this one will be by one. So this is E. This is where 300 came from, it came from E. And then we check the inventory status file. Inventory status file for F, we are using the period order quantity of two. Lead time is two weeks. The zero receipts is none, which is zero. The owner and beginning inventory is 600. So meaning that we need to now uh, go for the six products, the six items, the gross requirements, the way they're supposed to be. So we are using period order quantity of two weeks here. So this is a lot size, lot size, which means the, the production rule. So now what goes on here, we will say gross requirements, which is the same as demand. And then we have, um, so this is demand. Okay, so now we have the other one, which is the schedule receipts. The, the units that we receive from our suppliers. So schedule receipts from the information is zero, according to what we have been given here. Schedule receipts is none, which is zero. On hand is 600, so it's 600 here. 600 plus zero, this is what we have available stock, plus zero, this is zero, minus the demand of one's event of the fourth eight on hand. This one plus zero minus the demand of 300, you're going to have a 130. 130 plus zero minus the demand of three ski steel, we are going to have one hand of 200, 200 plus zero, um, all right? So we have this one, we are going to say 130 plus zero minus the three ski state. We have net requirement of 230, all right? So we have the net requirements of 230 in this way, because it's 130 plus zero to meet the three ski state. It's not enough, we have the net requirement, which is a shortage in this week. So when you have this shortage, what you do is in this case, they are telling us that order the, order for two periods, order the order the requirements of that period. So order the demand of that period, meaning order um, the three ski stay because of your problem. So order for these two periods. So order the three ski stay plus the 200 minus what is already there. So we're going to order the three ski stay, which is the three ski stay, we order three ski stay plus the 200 then minus what is already there, which is 130. So we are going to order the 430 in this week. So we're going to have this one, three ski stay. We order the three ski stay here in this period because we have a problem, we have a shortage in this week. Net requirement to 230, we would order the, the three ski stay plus the 200. Then minus what is already there. So what is already here is 130. So meaning the five the five sister here minus what is already there, which is the, the 130. So we should order 430 units so that we can sort out this problem. So we sort out this requirement, we still remain with a 200. Okay, so we have ordered for the period, period order one to two weeks means in the, in the weeks where we have the net requirements week three. So you order for the, the demand of week three and four minus what is already there. So we are ordering the three step plus 200 minus what is already there, which is 130. So we are ordering 430 to meet the, the requirement of 230. We are going to still remain with a 200. 200 plus zero minus the demand of 200, we remain with a zero. Zero plus zero minus the demand gross requirement of zero, we remain with a zero. Zero plus zero minus the gross requirement of zero, we remain with a zero. And then we check the aspect of uh, what we have on lead time, lead time is two weeks. So this is the time between when an order is placed and when an order is received. So meaning that we are going to have, this This would have been released two weeks before. So this is about how this question came, came in. So this is on MRP. So what is important as we look at material requirement planning is just to make sure that we do the, the product structure tree in a, uh, correctly, then you, you find that you get everything correct. So under this product FMRP, you can even uh, confirm it on this other side, you find that you have a 430 for F in that week. So this is product F, this is product E. So they are getting the telling the same ones as the 430 here. 
Okay, so that is what we have for set in this week one. The, the, the other one we have is this one here. So you just really need to understand, this, need to go through this material. If there's any concern, if there's any question or problem, you are free to ask questions. So yes, this product structure three is what is very, very important as you look at MRP. From here, then you can build up and start preparing the MRP for each product. So you have done MRP for product C, MRP for product D, MRP for product E, and MRP for product F. So this marks the end of this assignment. Unless there are any other questions. Unless there are any questions.